Welcome back to This Is Working. I'm Dan Roth, LinkedIn's Editor-in-Chief. On this show, we talk to leaders who have a significant impact on how we work and how we live. Today, my guest is Johnny C. Taylor Jr. We're in the middle of a reshuffle, a time when we're all rethinking how we work, where we work, even why we're working. Johnny Taylor has another phrase for this. He's calling it a reset. He just wrote a book about it. Johnny knows a thing or two about resets. He's the president and CEO of SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management. It's the organization that sets the North Star for the HR industry. What the bar is to lawyers or the AMA is to doctors, SHRM is to 300,000 plus HR pros. But before heading up the trade group, Johnny saw the ins and outs of multiple industries. He's a former journalist and attorney turned HR executive with experience at IAC, Paramount, Blockbuster, and more. He's seen the best and worst of companies and believes that the pandemic has been the reset that has made executives wake up to the importance of an innovative HR organization. With that, let's bring in Johnny Taylor. So good to be here. Thank you, Dan. It is great to have you here. Welcome to This Is Working. You just finished the annual SHRM conference in Las Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? This is like an indoor, a large indoor conference? Listen, almost 12,000 of my closest friends, right? It was actually a hybrid conference. We had about 8,000 people in person, another three to 4,000 virtually. So our hybrid approach. But this is a conference, by the way, Dan, that usually has 20,000 people in place. So we canceled it last year for the first time in our 70 plus years of existence and then decided to bring it back this year. And a great time was had by all. We had some of the best speakers. We had Michael Phelps, the Olympian, came multi-Olympian, uh, came and spent time with us and talked with us, the CEO and the CHRO of Chipotle Mexican Grill. And we also like ended it with Burt Jacobs. And if you all don't really follow his work, Life is Good, it was absolutely one of the most optimistic sort of, he calls himself the CEO, which is the chief executive optimist or something like that, right? So it was just a great time. Bert Jacobs, all right, I'm writing that down. What what can you teach us about? I have yet to go to anything that large in person. I think I wanted to do a lot of it. I'm not sure about it yet. I know a lot of organizations are thinking about it. Anything that you learned from pulling this off that you would tell others? Yeah, that we want people to act responsibly. So we assumed and we made very clear that we wanted everyone who dared to show up to, to make sure they were vaccinated. And even once they were vaccinated, we asked everyone at all times to wear a mask, uh, with the exception of a drink here, or there, and a grab of, of, of food to bite a bite of food. We asked people to wear a mask at all times and to the extent that you could sort of socially distance. So, you know, give some space between the colleagues and thus the event that was twice the size in the past, we toned it down so that we could give people more space. It was amazing. Well, congrats on pulling it off. That's great. Thank you. Uh, you just published a book recently. I just heard that you that your book Reset is the number three bestseller in business books according to the Wall Street Journal. So congratulations yes, for that. Thank you. That's awesome. One of the um, main points of the book, and, and by the way, I thought it was a great book. One of the main points was that the pandemic has been a real, you talk about this reset, it's been a reset opportunity for HR organizations, that That's this right. is a, a change in how executives see the role of HR and of what HR can pull off. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so for those of us who've been around HR, even if you're not an HR practitioner, for the last two or three decades, you know, there was this struggle. Whether or not HR was really a strategic value a partner and and whether or not you know anyone could do it because of course we've all hired and fired people so you know i can do hr as well as anyone well the pandemic really shone a light on how important this function is and the people who actually do this function everyday hr practitioners and so you know listen i talked to a ceo uh, april or may of last year and he said something to me he said johnny i got to reveal something to you I have spent more time in the last eight weeks, really important strategic conversations with my HR team than I had in the prior eight years. And it was, he said, I'm almost embarrassed to say, I actually now understand. He says, I was always the guy who said people are our most important asset and therefore HR is a, uh, an important function. But now more than ever, I actually understand how important this is. And so it's been an amazing opportunity for HR practitioners to actually show off like our talents and, uh, and the value that we add to organizations. That being said, 
what it's also done is really raised the bar uh, from an expectation standpoint because business leaders everywhere, not just CEOs, but you know, if you're a people manager, you now turn to your HR uh, expert within your organization to help you struggle with these really tough decisions because human beings, employees, have now, people talk about the COVID clarity. Well, they've had several months to rethink work workers and the workplace and they have come out of this on the other side of this although we're not post pandemic yet many of them have said i'm going to think very differently about my relationship with work yeah i want to get into that question about the the, the relationship to work but one more question on this hr role mm -hmm. why do you think it was that a ceo who would say that employees are our number one you know most valuable asset why why wasn't that CEO, why aren't CEOs, or why haven't CEOs like that in the past look to their HR uh, organization as being a uh, leading voice in that or someone that this person or these people have to sit down with and have to understand? Is that the executive's fault? Is that the HR organization's fault? Is there is there any way to know exactly why HR hasn't been uh, the very the, the leading voice in this area? Well, so I think there's plenty of blame, right? There are opportunities for HR from a professionalization standpoint, which is why we at SHRM spend a lot of time equipping HR people with the skills to actually do their job. So no, anyone can't do HR. There's actually a science, an art, there's legal implications to our practice, and therefore professionalizing the work it went a long way. So we owned some of that as a profession, but also, and I think business leaders have to be honest, uh, while they all went out, and I was one of them, I've been a CEO for now over a decade in for-profit and non-profit businesses, we said people were our most important asset, but our actions suggested that it was all about finance. It was about shareholder returns. It was about, you know, it was everything but people. So we say that when we get in the front of our employees and it just is a nice thing and the right thing to say, but I don't think we actually in our gut of guts believed it. What the pandemic helped us all do is really appreciate that this business does not work if it weren't, if, it, if you don't have the right people with the right cultural alignment and the right skills, your business will fail. So it was really an opportunity for us all to say, yeah, people, human beings matter and therefore HR matters. That's great. All right, Johnny, this is welcome to This Is Working. So glad we, you are here. We have a lot of people coming in on the stream saying hi to you. A lot of people in the HR uh, world in particular. So I'm going to give some shout outs right now. Uh, Isabel from Virginia, Marcus from Frankfurt, Joe from the Bay Area, James from Pennsylvania. Latrice says she was at the conference. It was amazing and she loved every bit of it. Jennifer <laughs> says she really enjoyed SHRM 21. She joined virtually. And Rocco says he just got the reset book last night at Barnes and Noble. So there you go, buying an imprint. Thank Can't you. wait to read it, uh, Rocco <laughs> says. So a lot of a lot of love for your work. Um, let's talk about this idea of we, we uh, at LinkedIn have been calling it the Great Reshuffle. You talk about this idea of people spending months rethinking how they work or what they want to get out of work, why they why they're working. One of the uh, big realizations from employees is that they can do their work remotely. And this demand for hybrid has been so high. There are some numbers out of SHRM that show that 52% of employees uh, are demanding this kind of hybrid work to be able to work remotely. 35% said they would take a pay cut to be able to do that. Right. But on the employer side, it's a totally different story where <laughs> employers are saying like nearly three quarters of, of managers who are supervising remote workers would prefer that all of their subordinates are in the office. That's so right. can you talk a little bit about what companies, how companies should be thinking about hybrid, how you bring... Uh, this employer and employee uh, view of where the world is going together. What's, what's the latest thinking? Yes, yeah, so from an HR perspective, and I can tell you, we think of our employees as our internal customers. This is the framework, the way that I think about this. And so if you had a product or service, you look to your external customers and say, what do you want? Like, right, I have to meet your needs if you're going to buy my service or my product. Well, similarly, we now have to listen to the voice of our consumer and those consumers are employees. That's a, a way to think about it framework-wise. Uh, what would you do if you told a hotel chain or your airline chain or any consumer packaged goods company, like, this is what I want, and then they wouldn't listen? Well, you stop buying the product. And that's what has led to the great resignation. In addition to the COVID clarity moment where people have had an opportunity to really rethink their life and their purpose and all of that, 
The other thing is employees are saying, listen to me. Um, I want you as an employer to understand what matters to me. And you used a term that's really important. Everyone led out with, oh gosh, everyone wants to work remotely. That's not accurate. What employees told us, if you really dug down into it, is they want flexibility. The idea that you must come to, come to the office nine to five, you know, five days a week, and, and you know, just that's what they're saying. Listen, we have proven, not that I want to work at home, because this funny thing happens about human beings. They actually like being around other human beings. So people do want to come into the office, provided you can be safe, you know, we've got to do all of the right protocols and everything to make sure they're safe. But what they're saying is, I just want some flexibility. And do I need to be in the office five days a week? No, maybe it's three, maybe it's four. Who knows what the mix is? But that's what we are starting to respond to. And we have to respond to, or we're going to lose our internal customers, our employees, and they're going to go work elsewhere. And so what's the, oh, to totally hear that, uh, uh, but it, it sounds like it's pretty clear that managers are saying, Hey, yes. you, this is not like, I, I, don't, I, I, I realize that's what the employees are saying to me. I can't deal with it. I don't know whether they're working. I don't know whether they're being productive. So what, if you're an HR uh, executive, you got one message that it sounds like that you're giving to employees, which is we're yes. listening to you. Yes. But then employees who are managers, you got another message, which is like, you know, they're saying, I can't do this or it's not working. What, what, well, what's the solution there? Is there one? We, yeah, there is. We focus on people managers and we talk about this a lot. People don't typically leave companies, they leave their people manager. So what we have to do as HR professionals and other business leaders is to equip these people managers with the skills to operate in a very, very different way, right? There's no question that they would say their preference is to have people in place. And there's value to that. We understand that a lot of really interesting things happen in the workplace, right? People get together and they build relationships and they, and they ideate and they innovate. So there's a lot to be said for coming to work and you can watch people. Well, what we've said is we've got to help our managers, our people managers, understand that that was 20th century. The 21st century demands this. So what can we do to ensure that you know how to manage a remote workplace? Many of these managers are not saying, I'm unwilling to do it. They're saying, I don't know how to do it. I don't how, know how to know if a person is being productive because in the past they were sitting in the office. We're making the case to them, well, a lot of these folks were sitting in the office. They weren't being productive anyway. So you can be as productive remotely. You can build a culture of people who are working remotely is just different. So the real big opportunity, so right now, I can tell you right here at Sherm, a lot of my managers felt the same way. Hell, I'm one of them, let me be transparent. I've always said my assistant, my executive assistant needed to be there. If you told me that you can hire someone to service an executive remotely, I'd say no way. Well, I was right. wrong. And the pandemic showed me that my assistant, Stephanie, can be as effective as she was in the office or working remotely a couple of days and come into the office another three or four days, right? It works. We've got to showcase for managers how it works, and we've got to challenge them to rethink, reset their ideas about how work gets done. Well, it sounds like what you're really talking about here is, is building up skills. And I know that you've yes. been focused on this idea of uh, the role HR can, can can play in helping with skills development, helping companies think about a skills first workforce. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing there? So it's tough. It's right. What we know is in addition to the fact that we have a major war for talent, that's only going to get worse, by the way, if you haven't followed the demographics, Americans start, they, they really stopped having children in meaningful numbers two decades ago. The year 2000, we began to see a slide and it has continued. Last year during the pandemic, Americans had 4% fewer children. So not only do we have an, in absolute terms, fewer people, but the demands of a technology-driven, a knowledge-driven economy says that we also have a skills gap. And so what we're trying to do is to figure out how to do more growing economy with fewer people who, many of whom have a real skills gap. So what are we doing? We're saying we're gonna build into organizations this cultural mandate that you constantly learn, right? And that we, your education is not just your education, it's our education. We as an employer will benefit from your skills uh, improving. So we are investing, not just, you know, giving this to an employee as a perk or an, a, you know, an accommodation for someone who's failing. We're actually thinking differently about investing in skills development. 
That's a real paradigm shift for HR people. And I think it's not just going to go away. So you're saying, yeah, right now you have ultra low unemployment and we haven't been able to get people back into the workplace. But Johnny, this too shall pass. Well, because of the demographic numbers that I shared earlier, it's not going to go away anytime sooner. Let me add even a finer uh, a point to this. As a result of the pandemic, many of our students did not, many of them missed two years of formal education. So think about what this feels like five, seven years from now when these kids who are in middle school who missed two years of math, to miss two years of English, those sorts of study, we're, the skills gap that we have now is only going to get worse. So that means it's incumbent upon employers to build within their organizations the capacity to build up the skills of the people who are coming in because you get the workforce that you get. You know, Johnny, that's a, you're talking about putting even more work on the shoulders of HR professionals to be able to convince their executives, executive partners, that investing in skills, investing in education is important. You've got to train the workforce. And you talked a little bit about this idea of saying, you know, this is not the workforce. This is not the way we work that was true 20 years ago. Things have, have changed. But when you talk about investing, it's not something that employers have been, it's, it, it's a cost center or, or it's been seen as a cost center. Um, but you're saying this is, you, you can't actually have employees, you can't have the right employees unless you're actually investing in skill building. Yeah, and that's the point. You know, uh, you know, we say it's not the HR from 20 years ago. Frankly, it's not the HR of 20 months ago. Hmm. Uh, you know, you think about it, asynchronous learning. What technology has allowed us to do is to provide training to people more cost effectively. I would submit to you that you can actually offer more training post pandemic for less money than you did before because you don't have to put people on airplanes now. We've proven that you can deliver demonstrably good skills training and develop your employees in a less expensive way. So it's more efficient, it's more cost effective, et cetera. So I think what we as HR practitioners have to do is sit down with our executive teams and say, if you don't do it, this is what it looks like. Not only are you going to lose your employees because everyone else is providing this training, so you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage in terms of attracting talent, but you also are going to lose because even if you have great people in place, because of how much change we're seeing, the person who knows a great software language today, five years from now, won't be relevant to you if you haven't taught them in the new software language, right? So this is now just a continuing investment. I had this idea, I was telling someone the other day, think about it. Back in the day, my parents bought cars. There was no such thing as a lease because you got the car and you kept it until it broke, right? right. <laughs> that was it. And then all of a sudden, the advent of leases, where you get a new car every three, four years. You just constantly keep a new car. That's the way we've got to think as an HR practitioner and as business leaders more broadly about talent. You are just going to have a car note. And you're going wow. to refresh every three years. These t this talent is just on lease to your company. That that's is, it. That's fascinating. I want to do some more shout outs. We have Crystal from Texas joining in the stream. Hey. Chloe from North Carolina. Rocco from Massachusetts. Uh, we are, Rocco, Rocco's been all over this stream. I love uh, it. <laughs> Michelle says, well-being is not just an HR job. It's everyone's job to check in and take care of teammates. And Holly says, I like the idea of being an internal customer. Um, want to ask you about you know one one theme that keeps coming up here in everything you're talking about, and I think it's one of the defining uh, changes in how business works, is this idea of employee voice and talent brands yes. and uh, the change that's happened once companies realize they actually have to be listening to their employees. In your book, yes. you talk a little bit about employee activism, yes. the kind of petitions and walkouts that companies have been seeing. And demands. Demands, yeah, exactly. Here is a list of things you have to do. That is a total change. That's a sea change. Yes. Um, you kind of have a, a nuanced view of it. In some ways, you're saying this is something companies have to listen to. And in fact, it's good for business when you listen to them. You have great examples from CVS and Walmart, maybe we can talk about. But you also say, like, hey, companies can't do everything. You can't just say we are going to, uh, to, to say OK to every single demand we're hearing from employees. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and it's, it's a really important point. Listening to your customer is incredibly important, but you can't respond to them all. And this is why we always end up, when you talk about employee activism or just listen to your employees, you end up with, I think I, I always rest on my guiding principles, right? My culture. So it could be that an employee says, I want X from my employer. If the employer is honest about who they are, we talk about transparency. 
it is incredibly important to be transparent and say this is our employer brand. This is how things actually, this is our culture. Not the thing that appears on the wall, you know, here are our guiding principles and our value statements. This is how things work around here, how things get done, what we believe in, our purpose. This is what we do here. And it could be, you know, Mr. Star technical employee, that this is not the right place for you because you're just not culturally aligned. And so I have always said, and most recently really began amplifying the message of, when you're hiring people, you want someone who is technically competent, in fact, very, very good, but you also want someone who's culturally aligned. So in the process of employee activism, as big people have begun to talk about, I want to hear from the employees. But sometimes what you hear from someone is, gives you a confirmation that maybe they're not right for your culture. And that's okay to say to people. And what I've said to employees is, listen, I want you to be happy. You owe it to yourself. If you're going to spend 40 hours or more a week with us, then you need to do it in an organization that is aligned with you. So I'm going to hear you and where what you say makes sense for us to consider and make changes around, we're going to do it. Management doesn't know it all. But there is a point at which you have to decide, is this a relationship you want to be in? And that's a really an interesting way to think about this, Dan. You know, you think about, we call our, our work family, our work wives, our, you know, we, we use that kind of language, but it really is important to understand that companies can't be everything to everyone. And it's really frustrating when someone comes in and says, well, they're doing this at Google. And you kind of want to say under your breath, well, go work there if that's what works for you, right? But it's, you're not being glib. You're not being disrespectful and dismissive. What you're saying is we have a unique culture. We're going to live that culture. Our guiding principles are going to be lived, and hopefully you are aligned with them. If not, then this doesn't work for you, and you owe it to yourself to find a place where you can really contribute and feel like you belong. Yeah, well, I guess that's the other side of the lease uh, uh, analogy that's that you were right. drawing. There might be like, hey, this is the wrong car for you. It turns that's out right. you're in the wrong car. You need, you need a Mercedes. You need a station wagon. Whatever it is, this is not right. Um, I want to jump to a question coming in from the stream. Debbie asks, uh, going back to the hybrid question, do we ever ask employees why they want to work from home? Is it just flexibility? What's the answer? Yeah, so that's exactly, Debbie, spot on. We were just saying, we were hearing work from home, and that was my point. Why? So at Sherm, we went, we dug a little deeper. And so it really falls into three categories. Some of them simply, simply, and believe it or not, there are people who just would prefer their introverts. They prefer not being in a place with other people. And so their preferred work style is that of an independent contributor in their own space at home. Got it. The second category that we hear is, well, I don't actually want to work from home. I just want some flexibility. I'm a writer, and I, or at least at my job, I spend a couple of days writing, and just being at home in silence away from other people so I can focus means three days in the office. I want to be there. I want to interact. So it's this, this desire you know, on whatever. You hear a lot about flexibility. The other thing, though, that's really come through is more and more people are juggling competing demands. Uh, they have children, but many of them also have elderly parents. So we're this sandwich generation. And just to manage all of this, to bring my all, someone said to me, I can actually give you more time if I don't spend time getting dressed in the morning, you know, makeup, hair, all that stuff, driving to work, that's lost time. So I can actually be more productive for you, Mr. or Ms. Employer, if I'm allowed to work remotely, partly. And so what we as an organization have to do right now, now that we've dug into it, it's not I just want to work remotely, it's at its core flexibility. That's what we're hearing consistently is just work with me a little bit and don't limit me to the sort of old school nine to five, five days a week. Uh, great answer. Johnny, you have a lot of people who are on the stream here who are HR professionals. When you talk about reset, you talk about companies rethinking how they work. What kind of advice do you give to uh, HR professionals who are, in who are listening to employees, who are hearing what the needs are of the employees and of the organization and need to, be, uh, need to influence the peers at the C-suite? Or maybe they're not even in the C-suite and they need to influence their, their, their way up to make people realize that there's been a change in how employees think and what they demand and that listening is going to end up being good for the company. How, how, what, what's your advice for how these HR pros can push this reset narrative up into the uh, C-suite? So listen, uh, like any other profession, I, I always fall back on data. You know, it's one thing to go in and say, I'm the HR person, trust me. 
this is my worldview of what I'm hearing, and you talk about anecdotal stories, there's nothing worse, and I can tell you as a CEO, when someone comes in and says, well, I heard from an employee X, and you're like, well, is that just that employee's opinion? Is that part of a trend? Is this, you know, what, that doesn't mean anything to me. But if you can gather data, re, you know, so we of course take all of the surveys, employee pers pulse surveys and annual surveys and satisfaction and all of that, but the more data that you can use to bring to business leaders, by the way, most business leaders make most of their decisions based upon data. So using organizations like SHRM, yes, that was a pitch because we collect <laughs> a lot of data, right? In our research department, go back to your organization and say, here, Mr. or Ms. CEO, I'm not telling you this just because this is what I feel like. This is what the data is telling us. 40% of employees right now are telling us, according to SHRM research, that they're considering looking for a new job. And so go back into the data and say, let me tell you how that aligns with our organization. And let me tell you why they say they're leaving. Is it because we lack flexibility? Is it pay? It, by the way, might be pay. Whatever it is, maybe it's our culture. The people are not seeing us live our culture or worse yet, they don't know what our culture is. But taking data in to make your case is how I've always, as an HR practitioner, when I was a CHRO, Fortune 500 company, I worked for a guy, you couldn't come in and tell him what you thought. You had to have data to support your position. And that is the number one thing that HR practitioners had, had better adopt because every other part of the business relies on data. That's great. By the way, was that Barry Diller you're talking about? Yes, there? Barry I Diller. I thought it might right. be. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's like, I don't care what you think. Right. <laughs> I but can you know, see your him book, saying. you talk a lot about Diller. I mean, Diller, Barry Diller really listened to you. This was a, you, you, you were clearly very influential at IAC, and, and, um, and, and you, you feel like you got there through being able to, to harness uh, data taking it in and making database, data back decisions? Well, yeah, that's, and, and by the way, I learned a lot from him. Now, I don't want to tell everyone, it was my first Fortune 500 CHRO job, so I learned a lot too. You know, I look back and think, gosh, I'd be better. But what I did was, and it was really important, you had to understand and look at things through the lens of the business person. Now, I will make the case to you that HR people are business people too. So I hope none of us, that's why between us, I kind of don't like the term HR business partner hmm. because it sounds like you're, you're a partner to the business as if it's something else. So I think you are, HR is a part of the business, not a partner to the business. So um, semantics you may call it, but it's a mindset. So sitting in those meetings, I really began, especially with, with to understand how the rest of my business colleagues were thinking. And therefore, I changed my language, I changed my approach. Even my ability to persuade them was influenced by getting outside of my traditional HR mindset and just listening to, they're trying to win. That's all, at the end of the day, they wanna win. And they know that it takes employees to win the game. So you've gotta help them be on this journey with them so that you were seen as a true part of the business and not just somehow a part to the business. Yeah, that's great. And I think semantics matter. That's, that's, that's a, a, a big change that can happen. All right, I want to read a couple quotes uh, coming in from the stream right now. James says, HR is a strategic position that can bring growth within the organization. So exactly to your point. Yes. Focus on employee engagement and empowerment instead of shareholders and profit. Yes. And Paul says, it's time can to... I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just got to respond to that. I don't yeah. think it's either or. So it's not this or that. Listen, and this is a really important thing, HR leaders. Businesses are in business to make money. So this idea that you are no longer concerned about shareholders is an awfully naive way to think about the world. Like we, may, we meet payroll because we have customers and because we have investors and people will invest in us if they think they will get a good return on their business. So let's just make sure as a community, it's not either or, it is both, you have to listen to employees as well and other stakeholders, but your shareholders matter. Let's not be stupid here. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good way to go down the path to tell a CEO kind of, I'm not willing as a business leader to see that both of us have to be happy. Yeah, that's exactly what you've been talking about. Okay, and Paul says, it's time to rethink, reimagine, and reinvent the way we identify, recruit, onboard, and develop our talent, including leaders. I think you'll agree with that one. Oh, let me tell you, and just think about this. If you had told all of us on the phone, and it's really funny in this podcast, come on guys, if you had said two years ago, Johnny, we're gonna hire, fire, educate and develop all of our employees remotely, all of us would say that can't happen. And especially, I wanna focus on firing, 
the idea was, well, you got to bring the person in. Well, I was always, when I was practicing labor and employment lawyers, saying, hmm, how much sense does it mean, does it make to bring someone into an environment where they could become hostile and this could become explosive? Like, we have to be more thoughtful. What we've done is turned it all in a dime. You can actually terminate someone's employment with dignity and respect remotely. And what, the, what has happened is we now know we can do it. You can hire someone, you can recruit them, you can onboard them remotely. Now, is it perfect? No. But what we've learned in this reset moment, the last 18 months, and it feels like it was only, you, I'm gonna go back to that just a second, but what we've learned is everything that we thought, every notion that we had of this is the way things should, should occur in the workspace, has now been challenged. And if you're not willing to challenge everything that you think or thought two years ago, then you're likely failing at your job. Johnny, thank you so much for joining us here today. That was a great conversation. I think you've given us all a lot to think about. Appreciate all of your ideas. And uh, there are even more of them in your book. So I encourage right. people to go check it out. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to everyone who's, who's tuned in today. All right, we release each episode of This Is Working as a podcast. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts and you can get more advice from the world's top leaders by subscribing to my newsletter using the link you see on the screen right now. Remember, we are live every week on the LinkedIn News page. On Monday, Nina Melendez will be hosting LinkedIn News Live where she'll be speaking to a negotiations expert. So if you need tips and tricks for negotiating a business deal, a raise, or a promotion, you will not want to miss that. That's Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So please join us. I'm Dan Roth, the uh, Editor-in-Chief of LinkedIn. This is This Is Working. Thanks for joining us.